Welcome to Impact the World, where I speak to creatives, entrepreneurs, healers about the work they do to impact the world and their journey around it. Today, I get to speak to Azim Jamal. Azim's TED Talk was shared with me a couple of months ago, and it's beautiful. His motto is live to give, and his journey has been moving away from corporate accounting to turning his life and his work and his service into teaching people about how we can give and support each other more and uplift each other, specifically in his case around refugees, extreme poverty in the world. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Azim. He is a beautiful light. There is a lightness and a joy in his emanation that I found delightful to talk to. So I hope you enjoy and you can find out more about him at corporatesufi.com. As ever, we put all links in the show notes. Azim, thank you so much for being here and having this conversation with me. I've, I've been really looking forward to meeting you ever since I saw your TED Talk. Thank you, Sam. Sam here. Well, one of the things that got me immediately with your TED Talk is your adopted motto of live to give. And, you know, I was just the day I saw your TED Talk, I'd just been speaking with a couple of friends and we were all saying how receiving is nice but there's nothing quite like giving and being in a position to be able to do that and whatever means that is. And so it was so resonant when I heard everything that you were sharing, but perhaps for those who haven't seen your TED talk, how did Live to Give arrive in your life as your guiding principle? So great question, Lee. Um, I grew up, you know, my dad and my mom uh, and my grandma, we stayed together for almost 40 years, at least my dad and mom. Not all my, always my grandma, but uh, my dad never told me that I should serve people in 40 years or more that we were together. But I watched him serve all his life. And so, you know, you don't learn from what you hear. You learn from what you see. I think there's a saying, right? Um, with words, you can only preach. With action, you teach. Mm. So I learned from my parents, you know, the giving and uh, how, how powerful it is in your life. Well, one of the things that you share that I think, I think if you can't relate to this aspect of your story, I think it's a story we've heard over and over again from quote unquote, materially successful people that for you, it was a game changing moment when you went from, if you like generating success and having a successful life, but feeling empty inside and then suddenly finding your purpose through going to work with the refugees. I would love it if you would share that with us and, and how that transformed you yeah you know um, Lee I work with many CEOs in the world I don't know if you're familiar with YPO groups young presidents organization so many of them are my clients and they're very successful and I go around the world and and many people in the world are still looking for some kind of purpose some kind of meaning some kind of and uh, and uh, for me at the age of 43 when I went to work with the refugees I actually found my deep purpose in a small tiny refugee hut you know, a priceless gift, you know, found in a, such an abnormal place that you would never expect. So it just shows you that, you know, uh, we don't have to have huge riches or fame or, you know, recognition uh, worldly that makes us find our deep uh, reason for living in this world. I mean, you live your life uh, making an impact and impact and purpose are so connected with each other. So, yeah, I found it in a small hut. And so to me, uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, something huge that makes you find your purpose, but it could be something very small done with an unconditional approach. Well, so let's look at you up to age 43. Like, could you describe your, your life journey up to that point and what, what you went through, what you were, was, what you were doing? Yeah, I was a dumb kid in school. I failed all my exams. I hated science. I had bad friends. We gambled, we partied. I was good in sports good in leadership qualities, but in studies was not my cup of tea. I was born in Tanzania in East Africa, went to Kenya, and then I moved to England, and then moved to Canada. So, but then in England, I did my ACCA in Hampshire, in Farnborough, and, uh, and I did well in accounting. I got the best result in the history of ACCA in, at that time. Uh, and then I had my CPA and Charter Financial Planning done in Canada, and I had uh, three or four businesses in accounting, and I was doing well success-wise, 
but uh, but the fire I got when I did my work with the refugees was a different level completely. So the enemy of the best is not the worst. The enemy of the best is the good. Mm. And what took you to go and work with refugees at that age? How? What was the impetus? Well, I was asked by by a nonprofit chairperson, would I consider going there to help with the budgeting as an accountant? And uh, I mean, as I said, I learned a lot from my dad. Uh, whenever somebody asked me to do something about service, uh, I, I, my, my answer was yes. What's the question? But the answer is always yes, if it's to do with giving, right? So it was no different when they asked me to go and do the accounting and budgeting for the refugees. And what, what did you experience when you got there? Yeah, so, you know, okay, so when they asked me to go, uh, funny enough, my passport had expired. <laughs> so I had to go from Vancouver to Toronto to get my passport done. So the guy I was working with was a really successful businessman who was heading the whole project. So he phoned me and he said, Azim, because of your passport situation, by the time you come to Karachi in Pakistan to work with the refugees, you want to have slept four nights because time difference and all that. So he said, when you come here, go to sleep because at night we have a big, big meeting. So anyway, I went there, da da da, and I reached there, and I have a habit when I came to the hotel, you know, I like to unpack everything, organize everything before I sleep. So I did everything. I took a shower, and just as I went to sleep, the phone was ringing. <laughs> it was my colleague. He said, "Can you come up right now?" So I haven't slept four nights. I put the phone down. I go, and he tells me what our job is. And Lee, I couldn't sleep another night because what he told me already shook my soul the kind of things we were supposed to do there and how we're supposed to help these people. Even before going to the hut, I was already, you know, warmed up in terms of what to expect. And when you got to the hut, what did you see? What, what were you experiencing there? Yeah, so I was, I, was, I was staying in a hotel called Marriott Hotel in Karachi. So I was taken to the, to the camp and escorted to a small tent of which housed about 11 refugees. So as I entered in there, <laughs> I was looking for somewhere to sit but there was no furniture. I only saw mattresses. I saw, you know, um, a kitchen. Um, I saw clouds of mosquitoes and uh, everybody was sitting on the floor. So I sat on the floor and I was given a hot cup of tea. Mm. And uh, just before we started the chat, I took a sip. And when I took a sip, my eyes looked at everybody. And there was a glow in everybody's face. I asked them, what happened? I just took a sip. It made me realize that because I took a sip, they felt so happy that mm. they could give me something because they had nothing else to give. Mm. And they felt that, you know, I actually respected what they gave me and took a sip from that little tiny cup. And it made me realize that you don't have to be rich to give. Rather, you become richer when you give. So say, the beauty about giving is nobody absolutely 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 nobody is deprived of giving even when somebody who's 90 years old who's blind has no money can give what can she give or he give love and prayers and forgiveness and smile so we can all give something and, and therefore and the more you give the more you feel rich about who you are some people have a lot so richness is not defined by how much you have richness is defined by how much you give mm. if you're very rich and you can't give you're very poor it's true. But if you're very poor, you give a lot, you're actually very rich. Yeah. And I guess for you coming from the world of finance, what, what, what would you say characterized the typical world of finance that you were in at that time and the attitude of people in the finance world? Like, was it what you're describing or was it wildly different to that? Well, you know, I think uh, me including, we all want another zero in our net worth, right? So we all have our goals, how much my net worth will be five years from now, what my net worth is today, how is it going to increase, what's the stock market doing, how is my house price going up or low? So we all do that. And I think, I think you know, uh, one thing I learned, and my brand is corporate Sufi, as you know. So my corporate comes from my accounting background. My, I worked in 20 years in the accounting field, so I met many senior accountants. So I have the financial side in me, and I think there's value. You cannot ignore the financial side because it's the balance, right? I mean, I think it's Tony Robbins who says, the best way to help the poor is not to become one of them, right? You cannot help a poor person if you're poor. I mean, you need to be successful to have the time and the energy and the resources to be able to help others. So yeah, there's a place for finance, but. But if you are totally caught up with finance and money and that's all you are driven by, then I think, uh, I think you'll get a rude awakening 
that what you're really looking for is going to be an empty, empty uh, place, right? In terms of, uh, you know, the pursuit of getting, getting, getting doesn't make you happy. It's the pursuit of giving, giving, giving that makes you happy. Mm. One of the things I heard you say uh, that that I've heard so many people say uh, who've done what you've done, who've gone from their pre-existing world and gone into a more extreme extreme and different uh, environment like working with refugees, going to places where there's chronic po poverty, they all talk about the metamorphosis they then go through as a result of the impact on, on them. And I noticed it, you, you share that you came away from the refugee camp and came back to the Marriott and curled up in your bed, curled up in a ball under the covers because you were just trying to digest everything that you were seeing and experiencing. How long would you say it took you to go from the emotional impact of that experience? Or how long did that last for you? How many months or, or years did that, was that an underscore for you? You know, Lee, I still remember the cab ride from the tent to the Marriott Hotel. I don't remember how long it was, it could have been 20 minutes, 25 minutes, I don't know exactly. But in that cab ride, I was sobbing like a baby. And, you know, it was so hot, but I was shivering and I was sweating. Hmm. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you, how, I mean, on the one hand, shiver and, and also sweat. And, and I was sobbing like a baby and the cab driver was kind of watching at the back, what's going on, you know, and I didn't care. And I was looking out of the window and to me, the, the shake of the, my soul starting experience started in the cab ride. And so when I went to the hotel, you know, and, and uh, went in my, room and you know had a sleepless night it was the build-up of that and you know and that's been my inspiration ever since every time i have a small problem here or there it, it completely pales you know when i when i think back in so yeah i think you know i, I mentioned in my ted talk that uh, mark twain once said that there are two most important days in your life the day you're born and the day you find out why so to me at 43 <laughs> I knew how I was born, but at 43, I found out why I was born. And so to me, it was a great gift. Hmm. And since then, since then, um, I haven't lost one day. And I mean that it's almost 25 years or so. I haven't, I haven't lost, lost, I haven't missed one day remembering that day and praying about what my vision was then. And I know you talk beautifully about how, you know, you, you say something in your TED talk about how we all stand on each other's shoulders, which I, you know, I, I think many watching and listening to this will all agree that, that, that most of us know that as a truth. You, you share so beautifully about how you felt quite lost for a few years with your accounting businesses and what you were doing. And that as you were beginning to write books and figure out how you would write books, it was your wife and your colleagues who supported you and kept the business going and carried you through that period. Would you share a little bit about that? Sure. Because I know many people right now are going through big transitions. They may not look like yours, but I think they're so delicate, those phases of our life. And it often is the people around us that can help us. Yeah, for me, my wife, Rosada, and my business partner, Ken, uh, were two angels. Uh, when I came back and I shared with my wife, I'm going to change from accounting for business, which is accounting for profit, to accounting for life, which is accounting for impact. <laughs> she paused and she said, uh, did I hear right? You know, she says, well, my daughter was eight and my son was three. She said, how are you going to support them to university? You know, and, and uh, uh, so, yeah, initially it was a shock and uh, I had to, all my enthusiasm was zapped when she <laughs> reacted that way. And then I had to take a pause, but I knew that my wife allowed me to go to Karachi. She's grown up in the area of poverty and so she knew what it takes. And so she encouraged me with one condition and the condition was we don't sell our accounting businesses. And we had uh, two businesses at that point. And, and thank God I listened to her. Because if I'd sold the accounting businesses, I could have been bankrupt. Because first year, Lee, I spoke 185 times wow. across the world. Didn't make a penny. In fact, I was spending my own money. Secondly, I spoke 187 times. Every two days, I was speaking somewhere. And I'm saying speaking not just in uh, one day I'm in Dallas, one day I'm in Paris, one day I'm in uh, Sydney. So I was taking every opportunity to speak. I didn't get paid. Sometimes I had to pay my own money, but I just did it, right? So zero money, 
I wrote my first book, almost took me a few thousand hours to write the book. I couldn't put a book in the bookstore. So at some point, you know, in fact, I haven't shared this story in my TED talk, but I'll share it here. Uh, when my first book was out, it's called Seven Steps to Lasting Happiness. I put blood, sweat, and tears into the book. I wanted to write something about giving and about corporate Sufi, but I, I was an accountant and I didn't know how to write. <laughs> I was going in circles. At that time, if you came to my house, you'd see 40 drafts on the floor. <laughs> like, you know, like at that time we were using computer, but it was not, so I would have a draft, I would print it and put it on one side. Then I would change my mind, another draft. So 40 drafts and my wife saying, what the hell is going on here? Anyway, so bottom line was that eventually I, I finished my books. Seven Steps to Lasting Happiness, and it was a flight from Sydney to LA, 16-hour flight. Yep. I was struggling, 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 but in the 16 hour, I finally finished it. You know, and so I published a book, and I, I couldn't put a book in the bookstore. And then one day I went to the bookstore, book was out now, at, it's a bookstore called Chapters. In Canada, we have books, bookstores called Chapters. We have Barnes and Nobles in USA, but in Canada it's Chapters. So I go in the bookstore, now I'm not going to ask the person, do you have my book here? <laughs> you know, I mean, here I am having this big vision about what I'm going to do with the books and how I'm going to make impact in the world. And, uh, you know, here's the, all these high aspirations of changing the world. <laughs> and now I'm trying to look for my book. <laughs> so I, I don't want to ask somebody about my own book. So I tiptoe in the, in the bookstore and I go to the computer. So I put down seven because my book is called Seven Steps to Lasting Happiness. The computer says there are 70 books on seven. I didn't know there were so many books on seven. So I'm going up and down, down and up, sideways. Side, I can't find my book. So I put on happiness. The computer says there are 70 books on happiness. So I said, I must have chosen the wrong topic. I go up and down, down and up, sideways, this way. I can't find the book. I'm saying, what kind of bookstore is this? Then I put my name, okay? Azim, A-Z-I-M. Jamal, J-A-M-A. Then I stop. I don't put L. I look back, anybody watching? <laughs> nobody watching, because <laughs> everything was negative. So nobody's watching. I put L, Jamal. The computer blurts out, author. I said, yes, 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 yes. Author unknown. Oh. I said, my God, I gave every inch, every ounce, every passion, all my money is gone, all my trust. I can't even put a book in the bookstore. It made me realize that my friends were right, you know, my family was right. What the hell am I doing? I'm an accountant, man. What am I doing with this career? You know, instead of me helping the refugees, somebody will have to help me because I'm, I'm completely broke. So I got, I felt depressed. First time in my journey after so, otherwise I was like a bulldozer, you couldn't stop me. But when that happened, I realized, my God, did I really make a mistake? I was really, that was my lowest point. So as I'm walking away from the bookstore, I'm walking away to the door, and there's a small book staring at me from 10,000 books. Mm. And I'm saying, what's your problem? I've been reading two books a week on average. And the last thing I need to do is read another book. Look at my life. It's a mess. So I'm ignoring the book. And I come to the door of the bookstore and I've got three choices. The three choices are I go, I go to the bathroom. I go to my car. I go to the book. Now, you remember our colleague who passed away, Dr. Stephen Covey, a magical guy, right? Mm. He has a line, he says, it's called the moment of integrity, hmm. where life changes. So in that moment of integrity, I said to myself, I'm going to look at that book, but I won't read the whole book. I will just read the introduction. Okay. And I was, I said, do, do I really need to do that? I mean, what do I need to look at the book for? But something told me that, why is the book staring at me? So I went to this small book and I read the introduction. It's a story of a guy who goes to Second World War. He goes to Second World War and comes back and he's selling life insurance. Now, unfortunately, after World War II, nobody's, di no, nobody's uh, dying, so nobody's buying life insurance. So he can't sell life insurance. So he's going broke. So his wife and his child leaves, he divorces him, and his life is a mess. So he keeps drinking, drinking, drinking. And one day he was completely broke. He's walking in the month of November in Cleveland in the cold weather in the USA with $30 in his pocket, three $10 bills. He's walking in the streets of Cleveland and he comes across a pawn shop where there's a gun being sold. He looks at the gun and there's a tag, a small yellow tag, $29. <laughs> he, he puts his hand in his pocket, takes out these three $10 bills. He says, oh, I got 30 bucks. If I buy that gun for $29, I buy a bullet for a buck, I go to my dingy apartment, I can kill myself. 
this is in the introduction I'm reading. Yeah. But he says, you know, he was so drunk and was, he didn't have the spine to go in the store, buy the gun, buy the bullet, go to his apartment, kill him. It's too much work. He kept mm. walking. He came across the library. So he went inside the library and nobody stopped him. So he wandered in the library. He found some books. He looked at the books. They found them interesting. Next day he went again. Next day he went to another library and kept going, reading books until one day he came across a book by W. Clement Stone and Napoleon Hill called Success Through Positive Mental Attitudes. And he loved the book. So he wanted to meet the authors. And he found out that W. Clement Stone was the president of an organization. So he went to apply a job for them and he got a job selling. And he was keeping reading his books and he was selling. And one day he saw an ad. The editor is retiring and they're looking for an editor. <laughs> he said, if I go for that job, I can meet W. Clement Stone. He says he didn't expect to get the job, but he says if, maybe he might interview me. So I get a chance to meet him because I saw his book that changed my life. So he goes there and because he's reading so many books, he convinces the guy to give him a job as an editor. So he becomes the editor. And at, at that point in his journey, he writes his first book. Now, how many books will this guy sell? He's going to commit suicide. You know, his wife has left him. His kid has left him. He has no money. Look at me. I was an accountant. I had three degrees. I had such a book network. I traveled the world. I can't even put a book in the bookstore. Ever guess how many books could this guy sell? Guess 30,000, 40,000. Wow. In Canada, if you sell 5,000, it's a bestseller. You're getting 30,000. So no, you know, he, I thought he might sell one to himself, one to his cousin, one to his uh, library. He sold 36 million copies at that point when I read the book. Wow. And now he sold more than 50 million. His name is Og Mandino. He wrote 20 plus books. And the first book he wrote was called The Greatest Salesman in the World, which sold more than 10 million copies. Now, why am I sharing this story? What is the universe telling me? Azim, you're complaining. You gave every inch, every ounce, every passion. If this guy was going to commit suicide with nothing can sell 36 million, why can't you? I ran home on my website, corporatesufi.com. I put down when the night is the darkest, dawn is the closest. Mm. You know, when the night is dark, the darkest, when you're feeling lowest, light is not far away. Mm -hmm. I still struggled. I mean, I got excited with that, with that message, but I still struggled. It was not until my fifth book. This was my first book, Seven Steps. I wrote three other books before I wrote Power of Giving, which beat Harry Potter, then my life changed. But it took five books to get there. But that sign told me that I'm on the right track. Otherwise, I would have given up. So, you know, I realized that that the universe tests you, tests you, tests you to see how strong you are. And when you're completely giving up, then it gives you a sign. Now, I could have missed the sign, or I would have been oblivious of the sign or ignored the sign. And I would have been an accountant right now and I wouldn't be talking to you. But thankfully, I, I, you know, I took the message and it helped me to recover at some point. And, and all the struggle I went through, I would do it, I would do it again. Mm. Because without struggle, you're, you're a weakling, right? You don't get better at what you do. So you have to struggle to become better. I love it. Sorry, um, long story. <laughs> no, it's great. I, I also, it's, I like that, you know, the differentiation of you could have gone to the bathroom, you could have gone to your car, or you could have read the book. And who knows, maybe you'd have had a couple more opportunities to get it. Uh, but I love that you were able to get it on that day. So you saw these books as your best ambassador for the world, because obviously you can go and give talks, but they're all local. And especially back then, pre-internet days, we weren't sharing videos the way we are now. So the book to you was in a way your baseline foundation of how you could get this message out to the world. Is that is that true? That's what I thought, but but I'm not sure if that's true anymore because, uh, because I, I don't know about you, but I've written now 10 books and, and uh, you know, it's a tough industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've written books with Brian Tracy, and I co-authored a book, What You Seek Is Seeking You. I co-authored a book with Dr. Nido Cobain, who is one of the top in the world in USA, is the president of the North Carolina University, a Lebanese guy, you know, and, and yet with all the success and travel and spoken to more than 1 million people in 100 cities in five continents, even then, I mean, it's, I still struggle to, to, to I mean, I haven't, I haven't figured it out. <laughs> so the best way for me, the reason power giving it so well I'll tell you the story of Power of Giving. It was my fifth book. I caught the book with one of my clients in the accounting business who was a fundraiser, okay? And one day we were having Chinese, uh, Thai lunch. <laughs> and he was my client as an accountant, and he's a top fundraiser. 
So we were talking and then I think the giving subject came up and we decided to write a book about power of giving. But we both knew I was a nobody in the book industry and you know he was a fundraiser, but nobody in the book uh, world so much, so to speak. So we wrote this book and now we are saying, what do we do? <laughs> nobody wants to publish it because who's Azim, who's Harvey? So we, we wrote the book and we gave a free copy download, free copy. Okay, 35,000 people down, uh, downloaded the book. And they started sending us note, life-changing, powerful book, this, that. So we're saying, well, people like this book, so let's self-publish. So we self-published. Then we told all the 35,000 people, look, we've self-published this book, please buy it. And they started buying and they started telling other people and suddenly we beat Harry Potter on Amazon. <laughs> I mean, out of, out of the blue, okay? Penguin from New York calls us, he says, we want this book. <laughs> So then Penguin picked the book and they published the book in hardcover. We became again number one on Amazon with the hardcover. Then they published the book in softcover. I'm telling my, my co-author, we published the book, self-publish. It's become number one. We published hard copy, it's number one. Now they want us to publish again in soft copy. How many times we sell the same book? We did it and then it was number one on Barnes & Noble. Then we won an award called Nautilus Gold Award for books that create social change. And we went into 10 languages. And that was a turning point. And by the way, we gave 100% of our copyrights to a charity on that book. So we didn't make a penny. We spent about $75,000 of our own in marketing, but we didn't make a penny. But that book, and it's, I think about it, Lee, why this has happened? Because my first four books were not about giving, <laughs> about <laughs> happiness and about this. Because you know, I, was, I was not an author, so I was just trying to write uh, you know, as an accountant. So it took me four tries before I went to the essence of why I changed my career. So when I wrote the real book, The Power of Giving, that's when the whole life changed. I love it. And yes, you. one thing you said a while ago about books is if for those of you who aren't familiar with the book industry, I was told about six years ago by my publisher that the average book sells 3,000 copies. And that doesn't mean that every book sells 3,000 copies. They were just saying the average book sells 3000 copies, which I remember being shocked by because in my head, I always assumed, you know, books were flying around the world more than that. But um, but it's true. And I think what you share that's so true is the network effect. You know, you had a message that had already contacted people and then that group uh, helped that spread even more into the world via you guys, which is fantastic. But tell us the power of giving. So for anyone who hasn't read the book or, or knows the book, what would you say are, are like three of the fundamental takeaways in, in that book that you're sharing? Number one is the best way to get happiness is to give happiness. And number two is nobody is deprived of giving. Nobody, absolutely. There's no excuse for anybody in the world that can say, I cannot give. We can all give a smile. We can all give forgiveness. You know, we can all give love. Uh, so we all can, you know, give something, yeah? And, and number three, giving is not a burden. Giving is not a responsibility. Giving is a privilege. Giving is a blessing. Giving is a door, a window to abundance. You know, the more in the flow of giving you are, the more giving flows through you. The more in the flow of abundance you are, abundance flows through you. If you have closed fist, you can't receive. If you open your fist, you can give. And you can also receive the more in the flow of giving you are the more giving flows to you you know a tree which is a fruit and nobody takes it it falls down and rots mm -hmm. a river which stops flowing stagnates dies so when you stop giving you stop creating you stop flowing i love that law of circulation i have a a good friend who um was going through a a, a money adjustment in her own psyche a while ago and uh, she made a comment to me where she talked about wanting to use her money mindfully and give to causes. And then in, in a day later, she was telling me about how she'd been out for dinner and she hadn't enjoyed the meal. So she was mad because she'd wasted that money. And I just said, you didn't waste that money. You paid a waiter, a chef, a premises. A, you know, I said, you, you know, that money isn't wasted. You may not have enjoyed the meal and then you can choose not to go back there again. But you didn't waste money. You circulated that money into a place that could... And, and it was interesting because she's very abundant spiritual thinker, but for her, there was like a parental imprint that she had, you know, that was a parental belief and perhaps reality that her parents were in that she realized she could just adjust. And so I always, you know, I, I, that's always been a truth to me that we're circulating what we have. And I think money is such a strange topic on the planet for people. 
I, I've, I've always noticed this ever since I was a little child. I always found the nervousness about talking about money or what people have or what people don't have. So yes, money as a resource is, is, is something I would be interested to talk to you about because you're an accountant. So you're clearly uh, aligned with and unafraid of money in, in that way anyway. What, what do you notice about the, the world of money and our psyche as, as human beings? Like, what do you notice as one of the things that we could, as a society or a culture, do better with around the way that we approach money? It's a great question. It's a great question. Um, you know, I think, first of all, uh, one should not look at money as a bad thing because, because uh, it's like a sword, right? You know, it's a, a crook can kill somebody with a, with a sword and, you know, or, or a knife and a doctor could use it to, you know, operate somebody and, and save a life or something. So, so it's really neutral. It's how you make money, ethically, principle-centered, value-oriented, not cheat, lie, or be greedy. And then how you use your money to help your family, to help yourself, to have a better quality of life, to give your kids the best education, and then share, share for people you will, for a cause. So I think, I think we all have to, uh, you know, today, I mean, uh, Lee, as you know, you and United Nations came up and said there are more than 700 million people in the world who are in abject poverty today. Mm. 700 million people could be the whole population of USA, Canada, I think Middle East, Australia, New Zealand combined. Every individual is less than 700 million are in abject poverty, meaning making less, maybe a dollar or two a day or something like that. So there's a lot of need and these people, many of them don't have a choice. So if you have opportunity, you also have a responsibility. So do well, work hard, and then use it to create a better world. Now, now you see, what people don't realize, again, it's the message of the power of giving, is when you are driven by a goal larger than self. When the subject, which is the ego, disappears in the object, which is a goal bigger than ego, you become fearless. You become fearless. When I changed my career, I actually became fearless. As an accountant, I mean, I could at the most, at the most, service thousand people, at the most. Because in accounting, you can't meet more than 1,000 people and advise them. But in this career, I met, I've done much more than, more than millions because I became fearless because it was not about me anymore. It was about something bigger than me. So, so I, think, uh, I think if you look at money, and you can only eat three meals a day. You can only sleep one bed at a time. You can only drive one car at a time. So what do you do with extra money? So... We have potential, we have power, but why do we tap into it? We don't need much, although we think we need a lot. But when you have a cause that you want to help 700 million people, then you're driven to do a lot more than you could ever do, because now it's not just about you, it's about something bigger than you. And so in, in other words, by doing that, you're also tapping into your creativity, into your genius, into your potential, into your power, because you have this goal bigger than you. And then you're fearless, because if you fail, you didn't fail. You're trying to go for a cause. The cause failed, you know, and, and it's nothing about you anymore. It's not about Lee or Azim. It's about something bigger than both of them. So I think that's where the power of money comes in, where you realize if money has been sought for a goal bigger than you, then you'll get much more money. But if it's only about you. At some point, you will, even if you get it, you're not that satisfied because you realize how much can I spend? You know, if I eat too much, I get fat. Mm. So at some point, it, it, does, it loses its impact. Mm. So when corporate Sufi became born and your mission was changed, you know, what are some of the things that you're, let's say, proudest of with the impact that you and corporate Sufi have been able to have in the world? It's a big question, but maybe for those who are new to you and your work, it would just be a, interesting to learn what you're proudest of with corporate Sufi so far. So, so, Lee, I think one of the biggest, biggest beneficiary is yourself. Even though you didn't do it for you, you know, I share in my TED talk the three benefits I got. First one was my, my, my vocation became my vacation. Mm. The work I do, I, I'm a, I, I mean, I'm a leadership coach. I coach many CEOs. I love my work. I mean, I, I'm on my, you know, I feel it's like I, I would pay to get do my work. So, so, uh, you know, 
I'm 68 years old, even though I look 40. Yeah. But 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 I'm just. I mean, I feel I feel 40. I feel 43. Uh, it's a blessing. I'm not an ego here. But but because I love what I do, so I don't get tired. It's like Messi playing football or Ronaldo playing football. It's like so. That's first benefit. My vocation became my vocation. Secondly, because what I do, whatever I aspire, the universe conspires to help me. You know, whenever I give up, it shows me a path. I was giving up in the chapters bookstore, Ogmandino's book comes and shows up. Yeah, uh, my wife was initially not wanting to help me. Then my wife and my partner come in and, you know, support me. You know, I couldn't make money for so many few years in the beginning. They were making money and supporting me. My daughter, Sahar, you know, she did her, uh, did her uh, college US, uh, in, the, in, in Queens in, in, in Canada. Then she had a job with Johnson & Johnson. She was a brand manager managing five countries in Europe. She won a gold medal in Canada for marketing. She won a bronze medal worldwide in marketing. She went to Kellogg in North, uh, North, Northwestern uh, Chicago and was given the number one prize called McGowan Fellow from 425 kids. Did everything. And then when she was at Kellogg, McKenzie would come, Goldman Sachs would come and say, come into internship. She said, Dad, I've been there. So she went to Kenya to work for a non-profit called Jacaranda. You know, in an internship, there were four of them sharing one room, making $100 a month. And while she was there, she found women were dying, kids were dying because of the breast pump. She gave up her job, everything started her own foundation in Kenya to create a breast pump that saves lives. So for the last two and a half, three years, she's making zero salary. But if you see her passion and her joy, energy is amazing. So I, I, <laughs> I think she was inspired by her dad. I could be wrong. But, but to me, th that's the biggest gift I can see. And I'm so proud of her. So, so I think the benefit I got was my vocation became my vacation. As I aspired, the universe conspired. And as I went to transform the lives of the refugees, guess what? My life got transformed. So these are three major priceless benefits. Beautiful. And I'm just curious, because your kids were little when this began, but what did you notice, or perhaps you and your wife and your kids have all discussed this now, when you look back, how did this awakening that you had affect your personal relationship with your wife and your family? And like, what, what would you, how would you describe that? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, um, when my daughter was three years old in my house in Vancouver, this is unheard of, okay? Um, I mean, in my culture from Africa and India, it's different, but in Canada, it's unheard of. So my daughter, my wife and I, my mom and dad, and my grandmother were all living in the same house. So one day my grandma was sick. So she was in the hospital. So my daughter was three years old. So the nurse asked me, who, what's the relationship with this lady who is sick and this little girl? I said, I'm the father. This is my father. And this is my father's mother. And she couldn't get her head around it. She said, you all live in the same house? <laughs> Four generations. Now, my three-year-old daughter grew up seeing my mom look after her mother-in-law. And then she sees my wife look after my mom. right? And then she sees me giving up a career of success and doing all that. You don't have to talk about anything. It's just what you see, right? So this is how she grew up. And then, of course, my son was born a little bit later. And he, he didn't see my grandma, but he was with my parents so for a long time before they passed away. So he also saw the, you know, the, my wife supporting my parents. I traveled a lot, so she was there. So I think this example, you know, they, they have it in them. And I think, I think to me, from all the gifts that we have given our children, that gift is the biggest one. Mm, beautiful. And how many of your, well, I'll back up a second, because I think often, um, certainly I've met people over the years who have very fixed negative ideas about the corporate world. And that hasn't been my experience. You know, I've met wonderful people in the corporate world. I've met people who are doing incredible things in there to, if you like, enlighten or transform some of the old ways in those systems that aren't very service or people based or humanitarian how have you noticed how have you noticed your effect on some of your old let's say corporate colleagues or when you, when you came back with this light inside you to to run with this new way of being 
did you notice any resistance? Was it hard for certain people to understand where you'd gone and what was lighting you up? Or was it very much a, a beautiful effect on many of them that they felt lit up by what you were doing and you activated them? That's a great question. You know, first of all, when I was an accountant, um, I thought I was indispensable because it was my name. I was the main partner. My, my other partner was like an employee first before she became partner. My wife came later. So it was this macho man, indispensable. Without me, the company cannot run. But when I had this experience and I wanted to get out and I needed to be dispensable to, to be able to get out. Now, because I was so shaken by the experience and I wanted to change and help people, now I became so empowering and let go and let my wife and my business partner take over and all that. Today, Lee, if I spend one day in the whole year, and this is for the last maybe 10, 15 years, if I spend one full day in the whole year, it's too much in the accounting field. Mm. The only time they come to me is with a very high level strategic thing and swear to God, and in the heart, they're making more money without me. Right. So, so, so what has happened? First of all, I think my accounting clients didn't even see what happened. They just know Azim disappeared somehow, you know. And 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 uh, and I, I disappeared faster because now I really wanted to move to the next the other world. And I'm starting from zero as a writer, as a speaker. I mean, I had no talent or experience or background, so I had to put a lot of energy into that to to become successful. So I almost. It was almost like jumping off the cliff backwards. So, you know, I almost gave up as soon as I could. So it was very little transition. I th my, my wife and my, my partner picked up, you know, and, and ran with it. And, and as I said, they've done better without me. So maybe I was a problem in the accounting field. But bottom, <laughs> bottom line is the people I work afterwards with the, you know, the CEOs I work with in the corporate world, I think, I think see that. I think they see that in terms of... Um, I mean, my, 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 my uh, guidance to them is that, you know, the more you, the more you are impactful, the more money you make for your employees, for your stakeholders, for your customers, internal customers, external customers. And, and, and yeah, I think so many of them have been able to transform that at some level and, and see the benefit of doing that. And uh, yeah, so, but my, uh, but my accounting clients, I didn't have too much contact after I left because I just jumped off the cliff backwards and left as quickly as I could. But they can see, they've seen my books, they've seen my TED talk, so they follow in their own way and they can see the accounting business has done better and better and better. It's not gone backwards. Mm. So they see some kind of indirect benefits. Beautiful. And I know that you you talk about your work now as a synergy of business balance and beyond, which I love. There's, there's such a balance in those three. How do you keep yourself balanced? I mean, you clearly love what you do, so it's not like you're having to, but, but, but you know, what, what's your balance point? Do you go quiet and have some quiet time to yourself? Or do you find that you're an endless extrovert energy wise? How do you balance yourself when you recognize you need to recharge or refill? So, um, good, very good question. Um, usually I wake up before 4 a.m. because uh, my time for meditation usually is between 4 and 5 a.m. It's not always possible because when you travel sometimes late nights, you meet clients and it gets affected, but that would be my ideal. Today, for example, example today, last night I slept at about maybe 9.30 p.m. Uh, I got up at uh, quarter to four. I meditated for an hour, four to five. At 6 a.m. I went for a swim in the ocean today, okay? Uh, lovely swim for, for an hour. And uh, since then, I'm in awake. You know, I had a, 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 a meeting with a client this morning. I uh, had a call, a couple of calls in the morning. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think uh, for me, the, the I, I do the hour of power, which is exercise, meditation, and reading uh, early in the morning, uh, which helps me. And, uh, and uh, um, yeah, in Vancouver, because my wife is so busy with the accounting career in the field, so you know I get my space uh, when she's at work. Um, I, I, in 2019, I traveled 209 days wow. before before COVID physically, yeah. Uh, but but sometimes my wife travels with me uh, one, uh, a couple of times a year, and we go out for holidays, of course, quite a bit. Uh, so yeah, we have a, I think it's a very good balance between between um, spending time together with my wife and I in travel, and as well as when I'm in Vancouver. We normally have a habit of two nights a week. Um, either one night is movie, one night is dinner, 
sometimes we movie in the theater, sometimes at home. So yeah, we find and uh, um, because I love my work, I do sleep well. I meditate, I exercise as much as possible, and uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I feel I feel balanced. Beautiful. I don't, I don't feel over, I don't feel overworked. Once in a while, you get it. Like yeah. yeah, on Sunday this week, I felt a bit here, and but I didn't take any appointments on Sunday, so I had a whole day. See what I, what I do, Lee. You know, I, I'm involved in some poverty projects, so I'm managing right now eight countries. So it's India, it's Kenya, it's Uganda, it's DRC, it's Iran, uh, it's Madagascar, it's Mozambique. So four countries each, and my goal is to facilitate uh, calls every month with these these two of these places. So I have these poverty projects I'm involved in. I'm also involved in the poverty project in Vancouver. So a lot of my time goes into nonprofit work and I love that. That's my energy. So I've got that on the on the cards. I got about I work with about 15 clients who I work with yearly, CEO talks and they renew their contract every year. That's my base that I work uh, on an ongoing basis. And and before COVID it was different. I would travel, but now in COVID I managed to have a call every two weeks with them. Uh, it's an hour call uh, on a Zoom basis. Yeah, but we've got 168 hours a week. It's a lot of time. And I'm not involved in the accounting field. So so there's a lot of time. And so, no. yeah, I mean, I'm happy with my balance. I could be better, for sure. <laughs> it, so- it sounds pretty good. But but what I was going to ask you, it's funny, because I, I did have one final question for you, but that's now become two, because I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, what is it like for someone who is traveling 209 days a year to suddenly have COVID happen and no travel for, I don't know how long you had no travel for, but was that how, what, yeah, what was that like for you? So Lee, um, my latest book, uh, my 10th book is just coming out uh, in India, it's September, in South Africa, it's I think July, in the US, it might be, you know, um, October, it's called Spark. The title is Spark and the subtitle is Journey from Success to Significance. Hmm. Okay, so the main message of Spark is Spark does not depend on environment. Spark does not depend on COVID. Spark does not depend on economy. Spark does not depend on external circumstances. Spark depends on you. So basically, basically, you know, if you have Spark within, there's a twinkle in your eye, your brows are unwrinkled, you have a smile on your face, your heart is open, there's an echo in your voice, you have a spring in your step, you are in the floor, there's a glow around you. Yeah, and it's, it's not depending what's outside you, it's depending on what's inside you. Because external spark is overpowering. Internal spark is empowering. External spark is temporary. Internal spark is permanent. External spark is limited. Internal spark is unlimited. So if you have an internal spark, to me, COVID was a blessing, and I'll tell you why. I have a client in Puerto Rico. He was telling me, he's a very successful guy, as he said, in COVID time, you came and visited me three times. Three times, okay? We met three times and it was good. But in COVID, we spoke 26 times because every two weeks we were speaking at Tuesday morning, 10 to 11. So I was better off in Zoom time in COVID time than without COVID time. So, so I mean, I was lucky that there was Zoom and I could meet them. Of course, it's much better to be outside and traveling and visiting people. I saved money, hotel, I mean, flight cost, mm. hotel cost, uh, you know, stress course, waiting at the airport, delays of flight, this and the other. So I think it's really about how do you how do you navigate your life based on the circumstances? Yeah. You are the captain yeah. of your ship, you are the architect of your life, and you are the master of your destiny. You determine your future and you adjust yourself based on what happens around you. Not easy, of course, but what's the other choice? The other choice is to say, oh, why me? No, say, why not me? <laughs> and have you always had this energy, Azim, or is this post 43 you? Like before 43 you, did you have this energy and this attitude? After 43. Right. This is the blessing of, you know, uh, when you get a chance to give, you start to create, right? Because before mm. that, I was, uh, if you look at me, I was looking older than what I look now at 43. Seriously. Right. <laughs> and a boring guy. <laughs> right. Even though I had hair, but it was totally boring. <laughs> Yeah, so this whole thing came out from the from the hut. Mm. So I have to thank these refugees. Uh, you know, instead of me, they're them thanking me. I have to thank them for mm. creating this uh, transformation. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for thank you for being who you are and for emanating what you emanate because it's very contagious and it's beautiful. And it was it was really lovely to get to talk to you. So thank you for coming to the show. And for anyone who wants to uh, get deeper with any of Azim's work, you can go to corporatesufi.com. We will also share the link to that website in the show notes and also to your book and also to your TED Talk. But Azim, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Lee. I think you're doing a phenomenal work. I saw some of your work as well. And I think uh, you're authentic, you know, you're insightful, you're wise. And uh, and uh, I think today's interview was uh, credit to you for uh, asking the right questions and probing and I had a good time. So thank you. Thank you. I had a great time. It was lovely to meet you. So until next time, thank you everyone for tuning in on Impact the World. You can find Azim's work at corporatesufi.com using any of the links in the show notes. Take care, everybody. And thanks for tuning in. One last thing, Lee, um, mm. I write a daily blog. It's a free blog. If people want it, they can uh, sign in for it. Perfect. We will put a link to that too. Thanks, Thank Azim. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. For those of us who are sensitive, intuitive, or walking a spiritual path, it is our practices and the support that we have in our life that often is the key to how well we can walk through life. Nine years ago, I created the portal to be an answer to that need for members of my community who wanted to go more in depth with my work. And while my work is still very much a centerpiece of the portal, we have now added other teachers, other voices, other offerings, so that the portal can become a well-rounded place for you to receive nourishment and be uplifted, shifted and supported every single month. Here is a look at some of the offerings that you receive every month as a portal member. Once a month, I do a 90 minute live video broadcast. Don't worry if you can't be there live, everything in the portal is provided to you as a replay. But doing it live is a chance for me to be with you as a community. And in that broadcast, I channel, I speak about the energies of the month and expand on my monthly energy update and also take some community questions. Every month you will also receive an MP3 and the MP3 will either be a channeled message from my guides the Z's set to original music from Davor Bozik or it will be an energy alchemy meditation or some other energy teaching. These will be put into your members library and you will have access to them to stream and download. We also give you access to a classics library where we take eight classic recordings from recent years so that you can listen to more. Qigong and wellness teacher Stephen Washington gives you an exclusive Qigong sequence every single month. It's called the Body Energy Update and he takes the themes from my monthly energy updates on YouTube and creates a movement sequence for you designed to support you and your process as we go through each month. Stephen is also a wonderful meditation teacher, and so you will have access to a library of short, digestible meditations from him. As soon as you join, you will also get access to our bonus Intuitive Power Workshop. This was a tour that we took to several different countries a couple of years ago, and we had it professionally filmed. So you will be able to watch a four and a half hour video workshop where both myself and Stephen teach you about accessing and owning your intuition in a deeper way. And to round all of this out, we have special member discounts on courses of mine. We also have special music playlists each month, one set of songs designed to help soothe you and one set of songs designed to get you moving. And last year, we brought to the portal something I have wanted to do for a very long time, The Portal Presents. It's where I get to invite some incredible teachers, creatives, healers, musicians into the portal. And every month we spotlight one of them where they deliver an on-camera teaching specifically for our portal members. It's a beautiful new feature. We have had some incredible people coming in and we've got some amazing people lined up for the next year. And the final aspect of the portal is mine and my team's favorite. It's the community energy. So as well as having a private members forum inside the portal, for those of you who aren't on social media, 
We also have a private, moderated Facebook group exclusively for Portal members. This is where so many members get to share what they're experiencing, things they're learning, people they're enjoying, and essentially connecting you with people from all over the world who are focused on similar interests to you. My aim with the portal has always been to offer you as much value for your membership as possible. And I feel like in the last year or so, we have really been able to maximize that. So we look forward to welcoming you to the portal and we hope it is a place that can nourish your mind, your body, and your soul. Big love.